Welcome to Dear Romance Writer, where three writers who always deliver happily ever afters offer questionable advice for all of your relationship, work, and life problems. I'm Zio Axelrod. I'm Rowan Parrish. I'm Avery Flynn, and we are super excited because we have the fabulous Max Walker joining us Yay. today. Yay. Hi, guys. <laughs> of the Hello. perfect romance hero facial scruff. So <laughs> I'm does. just going to, you know, put it right there. So if you guys are listening, it's worth a trip over to YouTube. Uh, Textbook so, five o'clock uh, shadow going on. Yeah, exactly. It's good. And it's only after like two days. It gets annoying after a while. <laughs> it's very impressive then. So Max, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, what you write, and uh, what books book folks should start with. Yeah, so I write primarily gay romance with a mystery twist. Um, I think my biggest series is probably my Stonewall Investigation series. Um, and that follows a group of primarily queer detectives working to solve mysteries and falling in love and having all the good times together. Um, that so one, wait, wait, is the tag be gay solve crimes? Because it, that, it will be now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, and so they are very gay and they do solve a lot of crimes. And the one that's the most recent one is Love Me Again. And that one oh, is so good. second chance romance. And it's also an amnesia romance. So <gasps> that's yeah, it's really good, guys. Yeah. It's really good. But it's good romance, I'm sorry, you just made my whole day. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that one. And then I just put out um, a queer heist duet that is a little bit different from what I normally do, but it was really fun. It was a big crew of people coming together. There's this, another second chance romance in there that kind of drives the story forward. And there's a lot of hijinks and fun times ensued. So that, that one is called The Sunset Job and The Hammerhead Next. We, we love, love this. We love it. We love yes. it. Yeah. Well, awesome. We're really yeah. excited to have you here today. We have a doozy of a letter. So you guys get your beverages and settle into the seat. I'm going to be reading for a while. It's a lot in here. <laughs> so we pulled right. this one from The Cut. Um, and it says, growing up, I was always my friend's chubby friend. Chubby is a softer way of putting it, though I was often called fat. On more than one occasion, I was told that my friends were hot without any interest of interest in me. Looking back on it, I think men's response of just disgust and general annoyance if I ever seemed interested in them has totally influenced the guard I put up as an adult. Anyway, all that sucked, but I survived, and then in college, I lost weight. The world may see me differently now, but I still struggle. I'm saying this because it's one of the best ways to really justify why what I'm about to say next is bugging me so much. About two years ago, I was hanging out with a guy who very publicly announced he was in love with another woman who, quote, was everything I wasn't right in front of me and people I knew. It was kind of my nightmare. The moment I started attracting interest from men, I couldn't stop thinking that they'd rather be with someone taller and thinner and totally different from me. And she was all those things. I was embarrassed and filled with shame and felt all those things I felt as a teenager of not being good enough or attractive enough or enough enough. And my brain couldn't stop thinking I wasn't the only one who believed that either. It was hard and gross and definitely a bit self-involved self on my end, but that's how I felt. Slightly after all of this happened, I made a new friend. She seemed nice and fun, and I have great female friends, so I had no reason to expect she'd be otherwise. But then over time, I noticed she would contact any man I paid attention to. If I said someone was attractive, by the end of the night, she would have friended that man on Facebook and started to send him messages. If I mentioned a man from my past who didn't even live in the state, she would do the same. She befriended all the men that I dated, and then recently, the tool bag of a human who publicly made me feel shitty started seeing her in a sneaky but also super obvious way. I should mention that for the past year, I've been in a relationship with a lovely, wonderful man who is amazing and I have no interest in the tool bag human at all, but it still makes me feel gross. It's as though she's taking over parts of my life. I'm not kidding when I say she's found a way to be romantically involved with at least six to eight men I've been involved with or mentioned since I've met her. But this current one feels worse. And to top it off, she keeps inviting me to places they'll both be. So I'm constantly preparing for the moment she springs their relationship on me with the audience around. <clears throat> Long question short, all of this makes me angry and frustrated and mad and filled with a shitty hate feeling and I don't know how to get over it. My life is great, why should I care? My ego, however, seems to feel otherwise. Signed, feeling a bit single white female. And we can call her Swiffy for short because that's a long <laughs> name. <laughs> so yeah. Why is she still friends with her? <laughs> 
Why yeah. does she see her? <laughs> Why does she not like walk into a house, see this bitch, turn around and walk away? I'm scared for her. I, that's what? Right? <laughs> okay, for instance, like, and she crazy. started dressing like me and got her hair cut like mine. Like, it was, it's so- that's what I was expecting. It's her name, Jennifer Jason Lee. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack in here. Right. Uh, well, and I feel like honestly, the the letter writer themselves uh kind of answered all their own questions. <laughs> yeah. And ended with like, why can't I just get over this since my life is great? Because you know how everyone's always like, a life well lived is the best revenge, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, well. Yeah, I mean, if you're on your deathbed, you can look back and realize that. But, you know, most of us hopefully get to have like lots of grudges and enemies still in our yeah. life. Yeah. Um, I feel like, well, for the, okay, first thing is, I think that if you're someone who is who has a really good group of friends and isn't expecting that someone's going to be anything other than a good friend, you're awesome. And that's great of you. And also you are like, unfortunately unprepared for the vagaries of human awfulness that exist. Mm -hmm. And so it's not your fault at all that this person sucks, but you should feel no compunction to keep being friends with her. When, like, I think it doesn't matter if it's romantic, if it's about, about people you like, if it's about clothes, if it's about friends, like whatever the thing is, you are dealing with a person who only feels good about herself when she is proving that she can get things that other people want. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of a person is always in competition with people that she's friends with for like the promotion, the party invitation, the romantic, like whatever it is. It's not going to stop with people. Like this person is always going to want to show that she's good by proving that she can take what other people have. And that just means she's super duper insecure and probably equally traumatized to yourself in a different way. Or it means she she believes that the only value that she has to offer is by being sexually attractive to men, which same deal, like she's going to be miserable until she figures that out and you should not be friends with her anymore. No. Yeah. Yeah. There's already so much competition in the world. Why bring in someone into your close circle that's just going to enhance that? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, friend, friend groups should just constantly be supporting each other. And if all of a sudden they're, you know, stealing your 10 exes ago boyfriend, that's, that's a little odd. And I don't think, I mean, out of all the fish in the sea, like really, why, what, what's, what's the yeah. end goal here? How yeah. is this going to move the friendship forward? I don't think, I don't think it would. Yeah. Yeah. See, for me, I'm still stuck on the fact that she's like, well, number one, Facebook, eh. but <laughs> that she is Facebook friending like all of these people that she doesn't know just because there's a weird connection there. Mm-hmm. To me, that that feels very um, controlly mm-hmm. in that what is yours is also mine, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And and that is is really disturbing. And I completely agree that you know she just doesn't need to be friends with this person. Uh, and as a fellow grudge holder and stewer <laughs> who literally like will spiral, I will just start thinking about, oh my God, that thing, that thing that happened in fourth grade, I still hate that girl, mm-hmm. right? And then I'll spend like an hour and it's in the back of my head, right? So um, I feel you. It's very difficult um, if you are a stewer and a grudge holder to sometimes let those things go. Uh, the biggest thing is to recognize though what you're doing and be able to say, hey, you know what? No good happens out of this. I am, you know, absolutely no, no good happens from stewing on that. I still believe in grudge holding, but the stewing part is what gets you because that only impacts you. Mm-hmm. So um, if she, I mean, she says she's angry, she's frustrated, she's mad. And she just wants to get over it, but she doesn't know how she can. I think the first step really is recognizing it. And when that happens, being able to recognize that that's happening and sort of do some self-talk, mm-hmm. for lack of a better phrase, some self-talk and going, okay, I'm doing that thing again. I need to pull back. I need to distract myself with something else, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah. eventually I mean- point where you don't have to distract yourself with something else you can just recognize it and mentally fear yourself but yeah baby steps I think that's what she needs to do honestly I think the first step is getting rid of this friend 
Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> block like, her number. The fact that she, her. Yeah. she said she keeps inviting me. I'm like, wait, you're still friends with her? Like that friendship should have been over five ex-boyfriends ago. <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. yeah. the thing about, so like the first, when I was first reading this, I was thinking about like the whole, like, you, you know, you don't date your friend's exes. And I was like, sometimes that's just not possible. Sometimes exes meet and then there's just a spark and it happens once, you know, and then that happens or whatever. If it happens over and over again like this, that's, she's targeting them, right? So yeah. why would you keep somebody like that in your life, regardless of if it like Ron said, if it's an ex, if they're if it's an old friend, an old flame, uh, something you wanted that you couldn't get, if they keep doing this over and over again, they're doing it to prove a point to you, not for anything that, that you know for them. But yeah, like get rid of this friend. And I wonder what her other friends think about this new friend. Yeah. If yeah. they know and if she, you know, if they just discussed it. I can't imagine that they wouldn't want somebody like that around either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's sounds- well, and I kind of wonder about her friends that she's had in the past because if people were talking all this crap about her, um, and her friends didn't like stick up for her, I have concerns that she maybe just has like an unhealthy history of friends, right? And yeah. it's hard to break that cycle. That's true. That is a hard cycle to break. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, I growing up as you know a little flamboyant gay kid <laughs> um I had my rough fair share of friends that maybe weren't always you know the kindest mm-hmm. but I was able to recognize that and I was able to kind of you know gravitate towards the people that really did care about me and that did you know want the best for me so I think that and it, it sounds like she is happy like Swifty Swiffy not a, I don't know if she's a Swifty or not but Swiffy <laughs> um she's she has someone that she's in love with you know she seems like she's on a good path what would scare me is if like her friends switches her targets from the exes to the to the guy current, current. Yeah. Mm-hmm. what yeah. happens then so it's kind of like just nip that in the bud and seriously oh yeah kind definitely of. and and the I, it seemed like as the I was also the chubby friend who all of my when I was in like middle school and high school all of my friends were dating people and I was always the hangout friend yeah yeah and so I I feel very uh familiar with this and it really does set up a dynamic where like if you are consistently shown by everyone in your life that you are placed in one category even whether it's a good category or a bad category to you of course that's going to have an effect moving forward and you're going to expect patterns to follow the ones that have come before and I think that the real justice here or the real like important part letter writer is you saying like I really am happy why can't I get over this and I think that is actually the good question did your friend I usually advocate for like extreme honesty, but uh, you don't owe her any explanations. You don't have to tell her why you don't like, yeah, literally you can, you can block her number and never speak to her again. Or you can Mm -hmm. be like, Hey, I'm not into this friendship anymore. Peace. And like end it, but like, you don't owe her anything. I think that the, um, the reason that you're not over it is because it keeps, it's in your face. You keep getting Yep. catalyzed over and over again to be back in the same pattern that you remember, which was that you're like taller, hotter, like considered hotter friends. You're the less than friend. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. That's a horrible that's, feeling. that dynamic is what you're thinking of over and over again, because it keeps, this person keeps forcing you into that by doing these things and like, or I shouldn't say forcing you into it, placing you in that position, but you can take yourself out of that position mm-hmm. by ending the friendship. And then you won't be thinking about it because you won't see her. She won't be contacting you. And like, if you really are happy in your life and doing great, once, once the, um, the thing is out of your vision, you won't be thinking about her anymore until you like hear about her from some friend a year down the line and she's like a total mess or two years down the line and you're like well there you go yeah uh, and I don't think it's an issue of of friends and I, like I mean I don't know I, I I think that generally most queer people who are in big groups everyone dates everyone's exes that's just not a thing yeah, um, yeah. and I know in my friend group I mean like yeah uh <laughs> and so I, I don't think it's about that I think it really is about respect and I think the, the mm-hmm. way it's okay to date your ex's friends, your friend's exes, whatever, Mm -hmm. is if you're clear, a clear communicator and you're respectful and you're able to like basically act right in social situations. And this person is doing none of those things. Mm -hmm. And so she's the problem, not you. You should dump her, get rid of her. And I would suggest 
telling your friends like the rest yeah, of I was your just think, friends, thinking like that. y'all were saying I, not not that you have to try to like excommunicate this person or anything but just to be like I noticed this pattern it was bringing up a lot of shit for me I don't like it and so I'm not going to be in contact with that person anymore and that's mm-hmm. all you have to say you don't have to ask them to act similarly you don't have to ask if they agree with you but like making that a boundary that's clear to them will at least stop them from being like whatever happened to so-and-so and like yeah. bringing it up and like oh my god I saw her the other day and and she, might, she might be doing it to them too and they don't even know yeah. it they yeah right. just yeah. come together and be like oh yeah all right yeah. so I am very curious sorry before we get to the the writing bit I have to ask because everybody has different standards so when is I think you know dating an ex a friend's ex is always like I think there's a maturity level thing you know because mm. you when you're like in high school and stuff like that that's very off limity um but I think as you grow up and you get emotional maturity you you, you see that hey it's not always uh, a bad deal right. uh but what is that line for you guys when you are like no that person you can't date like is it like somebody gets married is it somebody's just awful what is it what is that what is that line for you guys when dating somebody's ex is not good or you can't be a friend then for me I think it's really clear if if the person that I'm friends with still has feelings for someone and it's still messy I probably wouldn't wait in there because like basically if I'm if I am attracted to someone or I am dating someone I want to be able to talk to my friends about it Mm -hmm. and if I were to do something that would mean I it was awkward to talk to my friends about it. That would be my first indication that it's not chill yet. Like if I were to be like, oh, if I were at that party and -and so-and-so was going to be there and everyone was like, how's your new date, whatever, I wouldn't want to say it in front of them. Then I'm like, it's still too raw. But if it's like, if it's like people date and that doesn't necessarily have to mean anything going forward. Like I, I am friends with exes. I know many people who are friends with exes there's no bad feeling there or and and I have to say like uh, I know that this is a thing because I read about it in books and saw it in movies but in my real life I have never experienced anyone saying you don't date your friend's exes I know it's a thing like in, uh, in some groups I guess but like never once in my life have I heard that in my real life with friends that I was dating that's just like not a thing that I've ever it only comes up, I think, when the situation between the exes is bad. Yeah. And so it's like, you know that they cheated on me or they treated me badly. So why are you going out with them kind of thing? Like, that is what I think I've seen more than like, oh, my God, you know, bros before hoes or whatever. Like, there's, yeah. no, there's none of that. It's just more of like a, well, you know that that didn't end very well. So you're going to date this person knowing that there's just this like not even like feelings but just well feelings but not you know like a love feeling yeah I agree because then also if that person is now dating your friend and they like broke your heart through you know being a complete asshole they're also now going to be back into your circle and back or hovering around and it might not be immediately next to you but even in the same room as someone that you know devastated you you're gonna be like really you had to date them like anyone else you could have yeah, but, yeah. but yeah I think that that would probably be the only kind of scenario yeah I've and, set exes uh, up before together really? <laughs> yeah. you guys would be great together <laughs> yeah. yeah I think it's a heartbreak level for me mm-hmm. you know what is that heartbreak level of the friend um but I like Ron what you said about the um is it still too raw to talk about mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. <laughs> I like that it's a good level yeah. Yeah. All right. So now I will bring us to our writing chat. Uh, so unlike this, you know, absolutely toxic, horrible friend, um, you know, have you ever written a toxic friend in any of your books? Uh, or, you know, how do you handle friendships and including them, especially in romances where so much of the focus is on um, the love interests? Mm-hmm. How do you work in friendships uh, and and friend groups within your books? Ooh. Who wants to go? Max first? will make you go first. <laughs> yeah, Max is a good. Let's see, um, so friends are actually a little hard for me at first. When I'm writing a book, like you say, it's very much about the romance, about the two main characters. I'm just like, oh wait, no, they need to have a friend group. They need to go bowling. They need to go do something to like talk about how much fun they're having on their date. <laughs> 
And that was um, that was earlier in the beginning of my career. Now, I, like my Rainbow Seven, it's a big crew of people that have like these interconnecting dynamics that I find like fascinating to write about how they bounce off each other. And in this new series I'm writing called The Book Club Boys, that's also a queer uh, book club called Reading Under the Rainbow. And they read a bunch of thrillers and mysteries together and they all just get together and have fun. And they also fall in love. So there it's kind of like, intersected too, where it's like the friend group is there, but the romance is also there with them. Mm -hmm. So I find that that's been like, the words are just flowing right out. And I'm having so much fun with the friends. Like not only are two of the friends gonna be the main characters for the next two books, which also helps, um, but even just the friends around them, like it's just, I found family is just like one of the best chef's kiss kind yeah. of books ever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so writing that is just like, it's a joy, but it is kind of hard with romance because you do, you know, you have the two main characters that take up most of the focus. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And it's hard to, not to fall into the trap of like, they only talk to this friend when they have to talk about their love interest. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you want them to have a friendship outside of right. giving relationship advice, but found family is also my favorite thing. I love writing big, huge casts and since most of my books take place in the same universe, they all, they sometimes wander into each other's lives, even mm -hmm. if it's just for a minute. Um, but yeah, I, I have written Toxic Friends, especially in the Lily series, like Candy, I guess, in The Girl with Stars in Her Eyes, you could call her a toxic friend. <laughs> Everybody calls her a friend, but she's definitely toxic. And they try so hard to keep her around. They try to give her an in to let go of some of that toxicity. And she can't see... What they're offering her so she just keeps piling it on and eventually they go you know what we can't afford to give any more energy to this so we're gonna have to let you wander off on your own which she also doesn't understand so i, I like writing them and, and it's funny because i wrote her with such toxicity that i didn't expect anyone to actually care about her and i've had readers that have been like well when is candy gonna get her book i'm like really you want her book you want her story i mean she's pretty she's pretty much there on the page but yeah they're fun to write too Nice. I've never written a toxic friend on page. I don't think I've written sort of people like recovering from friend breakups mm -hmm. or things like that. Um, I love writing friends. It's my favorite thing. Uh, I actually am writing a book, fr friends and siblings who are friends. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am the book that I'm working on now. I'm actually having this problem, which is not a problem to me, but will be a problem to my editor, which is that like, uh, I just have so much stuff in addition to the romance, uh, like like estranged family and coming back together and doing all these things. Because um, I just I feel like the the more as a reader, the more I can, the more I know about the main characters who are going to fall in love, the more I can see why they're perfect for each other. The more I'm like, oh, that thing that you said to your friend that's going to be important to you, like to realize later on. And then I get, have written like you know twenty thousand words of like two friends going on an adventure and then I'm like well back to the romance guess I'll edit it out later whatever uh so I'm I I fall deep into the friend friend pool you're really great at sibling rivalry as well oh thank you uh, like, you still have one I have one of your my favorite characters of all is Colin because I hated him hated oh, him yeah. in the first book and you made me love him in the second and I was like damn you Rowan yeah like <laughs> Yeah, he's toxic, definitely. He is so toxic. And then you're just like, oh, but he's so broken. I know. He's, so he's the most toxic know? himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. What about you, I, Avery? Um, I like writing friend groups. Um, I like writing ensemble books. So mm -hmm. um, so I love that. I think um, like the my Hardigan series, uh the four heroines are all really good friends and yeah. they have wine and paint night like once a week and those are just the most fun scenes to write because it's them just giving each other crap while the the guy that runs the paint and sip is like um telling them today's painting is all about the da the damage we're doing to the environment so please draw your amazon boxes and set them on fire you know so he's <laughs> like it, it's just it's ridiculous and it's super fun but I think with friendships, a lot of times when you're writing, you're you're really sort of showing the character mm -hmm. of of your main characters. That sounds weird, but you know what I mean. 
uh, and it sort of says something about them, I would always kind of, I think if you had a main character who didn't have any friends, I think that has to be addressed Mm -hmm. (laughs) within the book. And that can happen. You know, you can have your, your loners and things like that. But I think that becomes part of character's journey, I think, because you don't want, you know, I don't know. I also always worry about the people that are just only friends with their significant other. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it is, one, it, I worry about the amount of pressure that puts on the significant other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it is very real. Like a lot of people do have friends outside of their significant other and you need that kind of mm-hmm. break sometimes to go and hang out with other people. And sometimes those friend groups do mix. So I think that's important to portray. But it's kind of like how you said, Avery, where it's like you get these like inside looks into the characters and like these like inside jokes and things that just carry on throughout, yeah. you know, a series. And you fall in love even more with these characters past just the the happy ending that they get you like you just love all of them so yeah you you get to see a a facet of the character that the love interest doesn't see because they're still feeling each other out and here they are with people Mm -hmm. who know them really really well and you see the you know the walls come down or whatever and I love I love showing that side yeah yeah I think the friends are great for the come to Jesus moment you know, yeah, yeah. that that happens right before they realize they're an idiot. I, I love that too. I think that's really fun. Yeah, I also think it's a great way to show character growth when you can start seeing the way your character acts with their love interest echoing the way they act with their friends group mm, to show intimacy yeah. or you see them being intimate with friend group and then when they end up getting intimate with their partner, it's actually a really different kind of intimacy and you can see like, oh, this was what was missing or like, these are the things that they show a significant other that they wouldn't show even a really good friend. And I always think that that's like a great moment to, to realize something about their character as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Also, I have to tell you guys that Jasper is sitting, I have my computer on a box right now and Jasper is sitting in the box. And <laughs> I'm trying, <laughs> trying to show you all. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm looking at the computer so he wants to be what I'm looking at so he yeah. just himself directly under you guys on yeah. the that's so funny he's like, he's I'm much more interesting pay attention to the cat why are you abusing him why are you ignoring him <laughs> he's directing he has his little clapper there yeah. <laughs> scene what a product idea though to create like a laptop stand that has a cat space space in it so your cat can can be under the warmth of like, yeah, yeah. You and go. you you make the bottom of it keyboard shaped so yep. that they can like oh. <laughs> yes we're onto something yep. <laughs> million dollar idea please someone go out there and make that. <laughs> those fake little wheels that you put in the back of the car so the kids think they're driving but yes yeah. <laughs> exactly. oh my gosh that's um, awesome work well max it was amazing having you with us today please tell everybody again where they can find you what you have out what's coming out where they can see you let us all know all the things um you can find me at max walker writes pretty much on everywhere tiktok twitter instagram um and my upcoming series book club boys comes out in late october with love and monsters i'm so freaking excited about it so make sure to sign up for my newsletter and i'll send it out as soon as it's out and thank you guys so much for having me this is so much fun yeah it's been amazing yeah (laughs) such a joy um well and and listeners thank you all for hanging out with us um remember that you can send us your questions and we will answer them as such on the show you can go to our website dearromancewriter.com and we have a little form you can fill out totally anonymous uh or you can email us at Advice, advice at your romance writer.com <laughs> it's like someday you maybe... set up the email address <laughs> did. someday maybe i'll remember but not with enough confidence to just state it outright so there you <laughs> go um, or hit us up on any of the social media channels you can dm us with a letter and we would love to answer it on the air um, but yeah, so thank you so much to everyone for listening to another episode of Dear Romance Writer. We cannot wait to give you more questionable advice from this trio of happily ever after enthusiasts. Have a good one, y'all. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thank you so much for subscribing to Dear Romance Writer. 
Remember to keep sending in those letters at DearRomanceWriter.com. We can't wait to tell you what to do. Dear Romance Writer is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love, frolic.media slash podcasts.